So I am out here in pretty much the middle of Kansas on a very frigid winter night. It's about 20 degrees out right now. Uh, and I'm doing a little bit of stargazing. So I've got a beautiful view of the constellation Orion. Orion is a winter constellation in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's pretty famous, you've probably heard of it. And it's got a whole lot of stars in it. And they're all kind of different. So uh, we're going to take a quick little tour through these different stars. And I'm gonna ask you to make a couple of observations. So I'm going to show you each of the major stars in the constellation Orion. And what I'd like you to do while I'm showing you these stars is think about what kinds of traits can you really observe about stars. I'll give you a hint. There's basically two. What are the traits that differ between different stars? So let's start with the star Bellatrix. Bellatrix is on the right side of Orion when viewed from Earth. There's Bellatrix. And let's move on over to what's roughly Orion's head. This star is called Mysa. We're going to hop down to Orion's other shoulder. This star is very famous. It's called Betelgeuse. We're going to kind of scroll down this way. These are the three stars that make up what is called Orion's belt. We're going to come down to the left side of Orion's lower part. This star is called Safe. And finally, moving over, this star is called Rigel. So I want you to take a look at all of these stars, and I want you to see if you can find out what are the traits that we are able to actually observe in stars as viewed from Earth. Remember, there's two traits that I'd like you to look for. If you look really carefully, you'll see that there are these two traits that differ from star to star. Those two traits are brightness and color. From now on, we're going to call brightness luminosity. Now, if we look at, let's say, Rigel, we'll see that it's very, very bright. It's extremely luminous. But if we turn our attention over to, let's say, Mysa, it's quite a bit dimmer. It's not as bright. And in terms of color, if we look at Betelgeuse, you'll notice it has this reddish, orangey sort of glow to it. But Rigel, on the other hand, is an intense blue. It's very blue. And then some of the other stars, such as Bellatrix, are basically just white. Now, there are thousands and thousands of stars that are visible just to the naked eye. And there are millions and billions of stars visible through telescopes. And for each star, we can actually measure its brightness and its color. So with this huge amount of data that astronomers have been collecting over hundreds of years, we can actually kind of connect the dots and see if there's a relationship between a star's brightness and its color. If there is a relationship between those two, what is it? And that brings us to the goal of this video. After watching this video, you should be able to explain the relationship between luminosity and color in stars. All right, so I'm back inside, and we just saw that stars vary in both their brightness and in their color. And one of the first things that we should talk about is what do we really mean by brightness or luminosity? So let's do that. I'm going to demonstrate what we really mean by luminosity by using this candle. So let's light her up.
So this candle represents a star. It has a certain luminosity. And if you imagine that you are right there, and I bring this star very close to you, it's really very bright. And if I bring it further away, it appears quite a bit dimmer. But that's really kind of an illusion. The star is not actually getting brighter or dimmer, and that illusion that the star is changing brightness is called apparent magnitude. It's largely a function of distance between you and the light source. But if you're paying close attention, you might be able to recognize that the actual brightness of the light source doesn't really change as it moves closer, farther away from you. It stays the same brightness. That quality of brightness in this light source is called absolute magnitude. The absolute magnitude of a star doesn't depend on how close you are to it. It's an intrinsic property of the star itself. Each star has an absolute magnitude, its luminosity, the amount of light that it is actually pumping out. And that absolute magnitude is what we really mean by luminosity in this video. Thousands of astronomers have cataloged the luminosities of stars over the decades, and they vary widely. There are stars only a thousandth as luminous as the sun, while there are stars that are millions of times as luminous. And we have found out that luminosity is largely a function of a star's mass. A more massive star has a lot more fuel and therefore does more fusion. Fusion is a nuclear process in stars that releases energy. It's the reason a star shines. So a more massive star pumps out more energy, and that means a more massive star is also more luminous. A star like Rigel is so bright with a luminosity of more than 100,000 times that of the sun because it's more massive, about 21 times the sun's mass. And more massive stars burn through their fuel faster than smaller stars. Just looking at this small sampling of stars of Orion, we can see that a star's mass has a strikingly strong correlation with its estimated age. We find lots of massive young stars, but we don't find any massive old ones. This implies, correctly, that massive stars die out very quickly. Small stars last a lot longer. And we've also cataloged the colors of stars. Stars come in colors that fall along this spectrum. They range from blue to white to yellow all the way to red. The color of a star is a function of its surface temperature. A blue star is very hot, while a redder star is cooler. A blue star, Mysa for instance, is blue because it's so hot, on the order of 40,000 degrees Kelvin. A red star, like Betelgeuse, is only around 3,500 degrees Kelvin. Our own yellow-white star, whose name is Sol, is in between these two extremes, with a surface temperature of around 5,700 degrees. So we have this massive catalog of millions of stars' luminosities and colors. Using this huge library of star data, we've made some amazing discoveries. If we look out into space, we see a wide variety of stars. They're scattered all over, from bright to dim, from hotter to cooler. And if we graph the stars by luminosity and temperature, something incredible happens. This is quite amazing. This is a non-random distribution of stars. They aren't just random colors and luminosities. There are some patterns here. Arranged by luminosity and temperature, we find that stars are grouped. One of the first things you'll probably notice on this graph is a conspicuous wavy line of stars, stretching from dim and cool to extremely luminous and hot. Our star, Sol, is about in the middle of this line of stars. We also have an arc of dim, hot objects here. We have a group of quite luminous yellow to orange stars here. And there are some monstrously luminous stars in this group, which come in many colors. These star groups have names. The stars in this long diagonal group are called main sequence stars. Our star, Sol, is a main sequence star with a luminosity of 1. Anything above 1 is brighter than our star, while those with a luminosity below 1 are dimmer than our star. You can also see that Sol is yellowish-white in color. That means it's not as hot as these blue stars, but it's hotter than these red stars. So the sun is pretty average as far as stars go. 
These stars are called white dwarfs because they're whitish but very dim. This group is called the giants, and this luminous group is divided between supergiants and hypergiants. All of the stars we saw in the constellation Orion earlier can be located in this graph. Bellatrix, Mysa, Saif, and Rigel are all blue giant stars in the main sequence, although they range somewhat in luminosity and temperature. Betelgeuse, the only reddish star we saw, is over here. It's a red supergiant. So why are stars divided up in this non-random distribution? The answer has to do with the life cycle of stars. Stars change as they age, and that may sound incredible because when we look up at the sun or the stars of the night sky, they don't seem to change with time. In fact, stars do change, but the time scales that we're talking about here are so much longer than what we're familiar with on the order of millions, billions, or even trillions of years. All stars are born here in the main sequence. The stars down here are born with a low mass, and so they're dim and cool. These stars are born with a high mass, and so they're luminous and hot. Our star Sol was born with what we might consider an average mass, so our star's luminosity and temperature are about average. Let's follow the life path of our star Sol on this diagram. All stars burn through their nuclear fuel over time. As Sol depletes its fuel, it will swell up like a balloon, increasing its surface area, and become more luminous as it ages. But at the same time, the sun will cool off. It's burning through its fuel after all, and less fuel means less heat. So Sol will move up and to the right on this diagram, growing brighter and cooler. Stars that have moved into old age are called giants if they're of average mass, or supergiants if they're very massive. At the end of our star's life, it will release its grip on the last bits of its fuel, and all that will remain is a hot, dense core. So the sun will end its life here, as a dim, hot object called a white dwarf. Now the sun is about 5 billion years old, and it's expected to take another 5 billion to exhaust its fuel and fizzle out. Most of the stars we saw in Orion are extremely massive, more massive stars live short lives, sometimes as short as around 5 million years. These bright, hot supergiants will move through this diagram a little bit, but they remain huge and bright. Eventually, all stars of about 10 or more solar masses end with a bang, an event we call a supernova. <laughs> It may interest you, by the way, to know that Betelgeuse is near the end of its life and could go supernova any minute. But don't go running for the hills, it's probably not going to happen for a few thousand years. On the other hand, small stars, which are dim and cool, burn their nuclear fuel very slowly. These stars near the bottom of the main sequence are called red dwarfs. They're so dim that there are very few red dwarfs visible to the naked eye as viewed from Earth. Red dwarfs can burn for trillions of years before fading into white dwarfs. If it were possible to press fast forward and watch the stars in this diagram evolve with time, it might look a bit like this. stars would constantly be drifting out of the main sequence into these other groups, and sometimes we'd even see a supernova when a particularly massive star dies. And the deaths of stars leave some of the most beautiful objects in the heavens. Nebulae are huge regions of gas and dust, and often these are the gravestone of a star that has died. Small stars die a gentle death and leave what's known as a planetary nebula, a roughly spherical, symmetrical globe of colorful gas. Mm -hmm. 
massive stars die a violent death, a supernova, and leave this splashy blob of dust and gases that were spewed out from the blast. These splashy clouds are generally referred to as supernova remnants. So, to summarize, massive stars are extremely hot and luminous, but they live short lives and produce violent supernovae when they die. Smaller stars are cooler and less luminous, however they live longer lives and produce white dwarfs. And pretty much any star will probably produce a nebula when it dies. Sometimes you'll see these star phases illustrated in diagrams like this one. The general term for what's shown here is stellar evolution, or how stars change with time. Let's review the goal of this video to make sure that you met it. After watching this video, you should be able to explain the relationship between luminosity and color in stars. If you can't do that, go back and watch the parts of the video you didn't understand. Always do a bit of stargazing if you get the chance. If you get a bright, clear night, especially in the middle of winter when the atmospheric disturbance is at a minimum, go out, look at the stars. They're probably the most beautiful thing that you can look at at nighttime. And it's amazing what you can find out about nature just by looking up. Until next time, remember, you can learn anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.